Hi everyone, welcome everyone here in Nexus Center. A warm welcome to everyone who are watching online and in our centers as well. Those of us watching our North East Center and West Center, a warm welcome to you. And I know that there's a bunch of you who are the East Center people you're watching online and you are there uh, because this week is your breakout service. So we want to welcome you wherever you are. So church, let's give our centers and everyone there, let's give each other a big hand. Come on, welcome one another. We're so glad to be in the house of God. Thanks for being here with us. Uh, so welcome Pastor Daniel and Rachel, you are here with us. <laughs> I, I'm so glad for this series that we are doing. We're on these two parts of series, doing on sexuality. I know that from the last week, there have been many good uh, responses and encouragements from the various live groups and various people. And thanks for sharing your stories with me. Some of you have uh, personally DM'd me over social media and shared with me um, your thoughts and even your stories. So I'm thankful for you, for God that is uh, being faithful, working in your life. And thank God that we have the community, we have the church here to be able to journey together with us and everything that we are struggling in our lives together. So I want to thank you and keep the stories coming. And as we talk about this, this is only the beginning. And the stories, the conversations continue. And I hope that you can continue to just share with me and send to me your stories. If you missed last week, we're on this uh, two-part series, two series on sexuality. And the reason why we're doing this is because we know that the government mentioned that they will uh, repeal the Section 377A. And because of that, there could be several conversations and discussions that could be going on um, around us. So we want to prepare the church to be equipped and to know what the Bible says about these issues. Shall we do a recap about what, hap- uh, what did we say last week in case some of you missed it? It's going to be quite a long recap, so do look at the screen beside me. We have it there with, you have it there with me. The Bible is the ultimate authority for God's people. Uh, every believer, that's why we must develop a biblical worldview. The way we look at issues in life, the way we look at the things in the world must come from the lenses of the very unchanging truth of the Word of God. And therefore, we can see from the Word of God that homosexuality is a sin because it is not God's intention for sexuality, just like any other sexual sins. And one can be redeemed from it as well. And that is the hope that we have in the very gospel and the good news of what Jesus has done for us. And our sexual identity does not define us, but our identity in Christ does. Hence, one who has same-sex attraction, and we will use this term quite a fair bit in our session today, so I will call this SSA for short. One who have SSA can still choose to live in godly ways and build intimate relationship with other people. And homosexuality, remember, is not just an issue that we want to come to church or in, even outside to discuss, but remember that everyone who, these are people, people that we can love. And as a church, we need to grow to become a safe place, a community where we can be able to journey together with people who struggle with SSA. So this week, we want to learn how we can engage culture in this topic of homosexuality and how we can do it, every one of us, with His love. Shall we pray together before we start? Thank you, Jesus, for this uh, beautiful morning. Whether it rains or shine, your presence is here with us, and you are here with us as we are hearing your word of God on this very relevant issue that uh, the world is going to talk about, or in Singapore, we're going to talk about it pretty much in our social conversations in the months to come. I pray, O oh God, that today as we learn to engage the culture, learn to engage people around on this topic of homosexuality, help us to do it with your love, help us to do it with your truth. And both of them, we know God exists together in you. And I pray, O oh God, Holy Spirit, empower us and move in us and speak to us into each and every of our individual situations and lives, O oh God. We commit to this service into your hands. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Uh, there are many things that we want to cover today. So I said last week uh, that it's going to be more like a seminar than a sermon. So today it's going to be the same. Are we okay with that? All right. Did it feel like one hour last week? So today we can do two hours, shall we? Amen. <laughs> so it's, there's going to be quite a number of things that we're going to cover from Section 377A to how we should be relating to our friends to, uh, who identify as homosexuals to what the Bible has to say about how to relate to them and, 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 and so on and so forth. So firstly, I want to say I apologize that I cannot cover everything in depth. 
There is so much content. There is so many things that uh, we can go into and in-depth into, but we can't do that. But uh, I will hope that this will get you started to continue the conversation, to do your own learning, to do your own reading from the right sources to learn more in this, all right? So shall we start with the easier topic first? Let's talk about section 377A. I once thought that this is merely a law that criminalizes sex between men. Uh, and I, I believe, I thought so. And maybe some of us, you believe that uh, this way as well. Man, maybe that's why probably you can't see why we might need to keep the law or you can't see like what is the big hoo-ha about this whole thing. And like how come, you know, we are so concerned about what people do behind closed doors. Uh, I used to think that way. But when I begin to read more and understand more, I begin to learn and see and understand why as you read the various churches' response and statements uh, and from the pro-family groups, you realize that the concerns, uh, they are much concerned about um, safeguarding marriages, about religious freedom, uh, those things are being brought up. So my objective for this short segment in the beginning here, listen carefully, it is not to tell you whether to support or to reject the repeal. I say that again, our purpose here right now, it is not to tell you to support or reject the repeal. It is not political here, but there are three things that I need you to understand so that you can be guided further on why there is such a kind of like a concern and, 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 uh, about this topic. So are you ready? Number one, we need to be aware of the presence of LGBT activism. And in case some of us do not know, the word LGBT means lesbian, gays, bisexuals, and transsexuals. It is a broad term that we use for people who identify with this sexual orientation and more. Of course, you see out there, there is a whole long term about LGBTQ+, and there is quite a number of things in that, but we we'll just keep it short for that uh, today. And one important thing that we have to note, we have to differentiate the people here between people who are pushing for this activism and people who are just, and persons who are just same-sex attracted, or people who are just living the homosexual lifestyle. Because someone who could be just living this lifestyle may not be actively pushing a certain agenda. And this agenda is about a movement, locally and globally, of people who are trying, using various strategies to transform policies, to transform society, to accept and to celebrate LGBT lifestyle. And in order to do that, this agenda and this group of people, in order to do that, they have to fight for certain rights to be given. And in order for that to happen, traditional marriage, family, gender has to be redefined. So that's what the gender is about, the agenda is about. It might sound pretty abstract to us, and if those of us have been following the news, you would be able to have a glimpse or sense of it when you look at some of the happenings in other countries, for example, in America, in some parts of Europe, you'll be able to get a sense of what that ultimately looks like and lead to. So um, there's this website called um, everthoughtofthat.com. Uh, it's quite insightful where they actually uh, go, go through with you to help you understand the gay agenda in um, Singapore and how these activists are trying to push for certain things and what are the things that they actually want. There is another website that you could look, look up more and, and read up more. It's called regardless.sg. Uh, it helps to clarify certain rhetorics that we hear um, in the news and uh, around that to make us be more critical, uh, to think about certain things about that people are saying, you know, about freedom to love, about uh, that, oh, you know, uh, about um, marriage is okay, it's, we, can be, we can redefine it, there's no wrong in that. So they will help to uh, help you to really bring up certain points and certain nuances. It can be helpful for you to understand so that all these various public conversation and news, you can think more critically on them. Uh, you can follow their, uh, them on social media, on Instagram and Facebook as well. That will help you. Number two, we need to have a more complete understanding of what Section 377A is about and how the other policies are associated and tied to this. Some of us aren't really aware of the significance of this law. And that's why we are not sure of the implications of the repeal. And that's why maybe some of us are quite indifferent to it. You know, it's just like any other law and why, why should we be bothered about it? And the fact is that uh, uh, as you read up more, you know that this law 
is a law that other laws take moral reference from it, as you can see from um, the diagram here. Um, you can, so, and the repeal of this, the impact goes beyond individuals. Uh, it could easily lead to various changes in other laws and policies. And I won't go into details, but you can see from the diagram, the next diagram, you can see that the impact and the implications of uh, the repeal of 377A has a ripple effect on um, other issues and other things um, in society. And I took these two diagrams from a non-religious gathering um, that took place recently. Some of you might have heard of it in the news. It's called Protect Singapore Town Hall, and they brought together to bring up more awareness about what this is about. So you can check out more in this uh, URL if you're interested. There's a whole report and all the details are, are there and they explain what exactly it's about. So now, you come, now we come to the preaching part on this 377A. What are the biblical guidelines that can guide us? What does the Bible say in relation to this issue? In relation to this issue. Number one, the primary role of the church, we have to remember every one of us, because we are the church. It is to preach the gospel and fulfill the Great Commission. That is the primary role of the church. It is not to mobilize the church to protest and to petition against the government. That's not the primary role of the church. We cannot impose on the world God's command for His people. We cannot expect the law of the land to be fully in line with the laws of God. In other words, as the church, as people of God, we cannot be overly fixated on this repeal of 377A till we lose focus on the main task at hand. We, we shouldn't even be overly fixated on any other social issues that we lose sight on the spiritual issue that God has enlightened us to see as God's people, that the kingdom of God is near. We got to proclaim the gospel. Can I hear an amen from the church? And secondly, individual believers. With that said, individual believers, every one of us, we need to be involved in culture. And we need not be, we shouldn't be apathetic towards what's happening in the world. Oh, it's just what's happening in the world. But remember, Jesus has called us, every one of us, to be sought and light. Wherever that God plays us in, whoever that you're in contact with, we are to influence with kingdom values. Which means that some of you, might be in a position to influence politics. Some of you might be in a position to influence policies, you know, and do it with kingdom values. Not all of us can, but some of you are. Do it with kingdom values. Number three, and this is important, regardless of the laws or political and social environment that we are in, we are called to be faithful witness. And we've got to remember God's kingdom will still advance. Church, we can take comfort from the history of church history. We can take comfort from the Bible that the church was born in a time of persecution. They don't have the laws of the land helping them. And God, but, but you remember, God still used the apostles. God still used faithful believers. Even, you know, to, to, in whatever political and social environment to advance the gospel. So, in other words, even if 377A gets repealed, even if our religious freedom gets taken away from our nation in Singapore, it can never and it shouldn't stop the church from fulfilling the call of God that God has for us. History and Bible has showed us that even in a hostile environment, the gospel is still advanced. So that's why, church, we shouldn't fear what will happen to our nation. We shouldn't have, a, have a, too big a fear about what, what will happen to the next generation even because we, we should fear that we didn't obey and be faithful to God's call in our life and in our generation. If we do that well, God can use us to make an impact in whatever condition the nation is in. Can I hear another amen from everyone? Amen. In conclusion, in case that is too much for you, just one paragraph to conclude for you. Though the church is concerned about the repeal of 377A and its implications on marriage and religious freedom, the church main role 
is to preach the gospel. As believers, we can play our part as active and concerned citizens of the nation to engage and speak out in various ways while trusting God and being faithful witnesses in whatever environments we are in. So practically, so this is what it is for 377A. This is the easy part. We're going to move on into the main meat of the sermon. Practically in our culture, we need to know how to engage people on this issue of homosexuality. There are three principles I can give you from the Word of God, from various scripture that can guide us in how we can relate to the world and engage the culture. Number one, remember this. The world will oppose our beliefs. The world will oppose our beliefs. John chapter 15, verse 18 to 19. Jesus told his disciples, saying that if the world hates you, keep in mind that he hated me first. Jesus alert his disciples of a possible hatred from the world. And the reason being, Jesus says, hey, because I was hated first from birth by King Herod all the way to the crucifixion, the scorning of men. So in other words, the first thing that we should take heart in, church, don't be surprised if the world hates you. I say that with a smile. Don't be surprised if the world hates you. Verse 19 explains further. Jesus says, because you do not belong to the world. The values of Jesus in us is far different from those of the world, as we learned last week. Jesus' values about love, Jesus' values about sexuality, Jesus' values about acceptance is far different from that of the world. So because of that, the world will oppose our values and beliefs. And let me tell you, we might, be even, we might even get persecuted, hated, alienated for standing firm in our beliefs. That's why as a church, we need to be prepared for the social pressure to conform. There are other believers in the world that have given in and conformed. With the repeal of Section 377A and a greater push from the activ activists, believers need to be prepared for a different kind of treatment from the world that we face, that we live in. The world might openly express their dislike towards our beliefs, calling you bigots, calling you homophobes, and even cancelling you and flaming you. We might even get marked down for our performance in school, in work, because of certain values that you hold. I heard of stories of how um, some of the students um, because in their schoolwork, um, they are given a topic on, um, on homosexuality. They wrote in their Christian view on it, and the teacher marked them down because they say that this is not the, the sociological and accepted or view, and she got marked down for an essay. Um, there's this, uh, uh, there's this uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, there's this incident that someone recorded, an, ind an individual chat. My sister in a local six-year integrated program school had a teacher who mentioned LGBTQ matters in a rather positive light. Knowing that she was a Christian, she looked at her and said, while some may not agree, uh, almost in a sarcastic way, my sister felt slightly targeted and singled out for her faith, which she has been living out openly, which implied that she did not support LGBT activism. For some of us here in this service, in our workplace, we might be pressured to, to join in um, certain activities that don't express our values. Some companies might have this thing called the diversity, equity, and inclusive um, policies, DEI policies and initiatives. And some of these events, they openly endorse homosexuality. And some of us might be put on the spot to, to ask to, to be re to, uh, you're required to take part because of certain uh, involvement. Do we join in? Or do you make a stand? What are the implications? of your participation? What will the world see you as a result of that? There is even a group of you. I just want to say this. You struggle with SSA. And you choose to testify your story. You choose to tell people and tell the world that you, you can live in godly ways and you can walk out of your past lifestyle. And because you do that, there are some people from your past community heard about it and they send and they send hate to you. They diss you openly. And this is very real because 
Uh, I know of people who have experienced this. There is a social pressure to conform and not to stand out. And this thought can be pretty scary. The thought of like, wow, as a believer, I have to stand for my values. I have to speak out. I have to do what is right. We fear for our career. We fear from, for, for you know, that our, our position in the company. We fear being ostracized by our friends and our loved ones. And sometimes the easier way is true to just conform and, and keep quiet, you know, don't, don't, don't stir so much problem and discomfort around us. But church believers, we need to remind ourselves that it is no surprise that the world hates us for our belief. Jesus called us to be in the world, but not of the world. So the thing is that how can we stand firm? We need to anchor ourselves in God's word and be clear and convinced of what the Bible says. Because sometimes we waver because we are unclear. We have a responsibility as believers to learn, to grow, to understand the word of God, to understand what the Bible says, to read up more about this area so that we, we know why we are standing firm. We know that our faith involves certain of our morals and certain values that we don't agree with. And not just in sexuality, in fact, but in fact, I think that as we talk about this, it is a good call for some of us that to wake up call that, hey, maybe we are just coming to church, but are we really learning about the biblical view about various social issues around and know what the Bible says and know how to think theologically about these issues? Parents, you have a responsibility as well to educate your children about sexuality. Because if you don't, TikTokers will tell them what sex is about. Because the statistics have shown us that they spend on an average of 45 minutes a day on TikTok. And somewhere, somehow, someone is going to teach them about something about sexuality there. If not, their friends will do that. If not, pornography will do that. Sex is everywhere around us. I remember when my son was younger, right? He asked me this very funny question. On the street, he asked me, Papa, how come these people don't wear so much clothes on the street, you know? So, <laughs> it's not that they don't wear so much clothes. They choose to wear lesser. And it's hard for me to explain and things like that. And sometimes parents, we are shy to, to talk about this area of sexuality, maybe because of our Asian culture. And another common thought that I heard from parents is this. Too much, too soon. Parents worry that I say too much, you know, too soon. That I scared that I, I, I pollute them, you know, or, or say too much. But sometimes it ends up too little, too late. That we don't engage and talk about it as much as we should. We keep waiting for our children to be ready for the sex talk. But we can't define what ready is, when ready is. We can say maybe next year, maybe when it's nine, maybe it's ten, maybe go to secondary school. Secondary school, ah, yeah, maybe very shy, maybe grow up a bit and understand me better. Grow up ready, oh no, you know. <laughs> they, they say, Papa, let me teach you, you know. The, sol the solution is age-appropriate sex talks. It is not one big sex talk, parents. It is not that one moment that you sit or your kids down and say, all right, today, Papa is going to give you the sex talk, you know. That is not how it's going to happen. But it's a series of continuous talks and education, you know. And we know that that's a concern for many of your parents and uh, some of you parents-to-be. Uh, but don't worry, when they are zero to one, you don't need to talk to them about sex. But this is a concern, uh, I know. And I think our equip, our, I believe our equipment department has put up certain resources up. Uh, you can ask your LGLs. LGLs, remember that you have a link that you're given, and we have updated the link to put up some resources on how parents can engage their children on sexuality at various age groups. So I hope that will be helpful for a start. But next year, we'll be uh, organizing a seminar to, on, and also on a regular basis to equip our parents on this topic, on how to engage our children on the topic of sexuality and even homosexuality as well. So do it now. Do it often. Do it when the opportunity comes. I'm talking about a sex talk, all right? So number two, the world needs our voice. The world needs our voice. The world will oppose our values. But remember that God placed us in different circles of relationship. God placed us in different arenas. 
and different positions so that we can be sought and light and make impact in various places to various people. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, Paul reminds us that we are given this message of reconciliation and we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. We are Christ's representatives. We literally represent Christ, like just how the ambassador represents the nation. Through the way that you speak, through the way that you love, we represent Christ to people around. And that is why there'll be times in your workplace, there'll be times that in your family, the people around you will say, hey, you Christian, can you tell me why you Christian always say this and do that? What, what, what do Christians think about homosexuality? What do Christians think it is wrong? Those are the times you will wish that I have taken more notes during sermon. Those are the times that you will want to be prepared to be, be able to answer, to represent Christ, and not just give the correct answer, but learn how to say it in a way that helps them to understand God, God's design, the beauty of His design, and how His love, and it's not just an issue and against people, but God really loves and cares for people. And this is one of the many sexual sins, and our identity need not be defined by it. Unless and until we read and we understand this, when people ask us, we were like, um, um, we, and sometimes we are afraid that we say the wrong things. That's why maybe we keep quiet. But there are many, there are sometimes that we don't need to engage. There are sometimes we don't need to share. Because there could be times where it is not wise. Because people are not ready to hear us. Maybe people, people just want to pick an argument. That's why Paul was telling to the Colossians, especially when relating with people out of the church. Remember this, church, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the use of every opportunity. And remember, as you relate to people out of the church, make sure that our conversation is full of grace, seasoned with salt, not in an argumentative way, seasoned with salt, meaning to add flavor, to add value. Don't just share for the sake of it. Share to add value. Think how it can benefit the person and help that person to understand and see more of God. And you ask yourself, is this the right opportunity? Maybe there's a better opportunity that I can bring this up in a calm way, full of grace, in a way that's appropriate and talk about it. So what we are not to do, church, is this. Remember, we are not to go around to convince people that this is a sin. I mean, we can't because people might have different moralities from us. People might take a different, uh, have a different moral compass and we can't convince them it is a sin or wrong. But we can engage on why we think this is not good and why we think there's a better way. Why we think there's a better way. It's not about winning arguments. You might win the argument, but you will lose the person. It is not just about proving that your point is correct. And especially so, don't debate over social media. And that's something that sometimes, the more I hear, see it, the more I find that uh, it might not be helpful. Don't debate over social media. But granted, there might be some of you, I would say a very handful and small group of us, that are very well-versed in this topic, is able to articulate your thoughts in a way that's full of grace and balancedly, clearly, over social media. Maybe you could do it, but for the most of us, probably, that, is, that is, might not be the best idea to engage and debate over social media. And definitely not to take a militant stance when we, dis, when we engage. It is not a warfare we're trying to fight. Don't use warfare languages. It is not we're trying to fight a battle, trying to like, uh, win the darkness over. It's, it's not about that. Because by doing those things, by saying those things, it is not helpful for the, for the, engage, for the, for the conversations to happen in a civil, graceful way in a community. At the end of the day, through what we share, we want to make the gospel more attractive, not repulsive. Remember that. We want to make the gospel more attractive. The next area that I'm going to talk about is an area that I hear quite a number of questions on. And maybe I, perhaps I would say that it might be the greatest impact that we can make when I say the world needs our voice. And it is relating to pre-believers who identify themselves as gays and LGBT. 
I won't ask you to raise your hand, but I believe that there are quite a number of us here. You have friends that you relate on a regular basis, or you have friends in your social media that you know that they are openly living this lifestyle and they are not a believer. And the question that I hear this from around is that how can we relate to them? It's a common question, and sometimes this question um, reveals certain things in the way when we ask this question. Maybe, probably, we might be uninformed. We might be clouded by certain misconception about people with this struggle. Maybe some of us grew up in a generation we are not exposed in this aspect as much. And maybe some of us might have certain old ideas about these people. I think I talked about it last week that if we, if we have been making fun of them, dissing this and just rubbishing this issue and just think that, yeah, lah, it's, so, you know, it's so clear what the Bible says and we're unwilling to be, to be open and listen, maybe we need to do that. But for those of you who have asked the question, very good, because it is a sign of your humility and it's a start of us as a church to learn, to have conversations about this issue. So this is how it might sound like for most of us in our situation. I have a friend called John. This is an example, right? He's openly gay and my classmates all accept him or my workplace all accepts him and is happy for him. He tells me how happy he is about the repeal of uh, Section 377A and jokes cheekily about his partner. He also shares about his relationships issues with us and asks us for advice. How should I relate to him? If I love him, should I be telling him the truth of what the Bible says? Do I need to convince him that what he's doing is wrong and sinful? So right now, we want to get Pastor Michael on the stage. Okay, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's a common scenario. I think most of us will have this scenario and issue. I give you a start line for this. Relate to them like any other pre-believer friend. Your goal is to love them and find opportunities to discover their needs and how the gospel meets them, just like any pre-believer friend that you have in your life. Can I show me your hands, right? How many of you, right, you have a friend around you that do not know Jesus? Come on, show me your hands. Okay, thank you, church. I think that's everyone. <laughs> Relate to them like any other pre-believer friend. Treat them like how you would treat another friend that will watch pornography, that will tell you that this is normal. I don't think that we will confront our friend and tell them that, hey, pornography is wrong and sinful, you know. I mean, I, I don't think, you don't, you don't do that because you know that even if you talk to them, you know, that's not the point. You know, they might not even see it as morally wrong or even as wrong. They might ask you for your viewpoint about how you view it uh, as a Christian. And when being asked, you help him to understand how you see it, how your worldview is and how God's design is. But you don't do it to convince him or her to live in such a way. That's not your goal. You're not sharing this to convince the person to take on your worldview and your values. Love them like any individuals. They are more than their sexual orientation and lifestyle. And remember this. Sometimes I do not know why we... Maybe there is this thought in the culture that it doesn't mean that if they are LGBT, means that they hate Christians. Or it means that they are too far from Jesus, that we, we, we do not know or we need some special method to relate to them. Jesus showed us by his example. He defied culture by choosing to eat with sinners, going to their homes, spending extended time with them. Jesus showed us that he's interested to know people who are very unlike him and people that the world thinks that are sinners or ostracized. And he seeks to build relationships with them. So the thing is, as God's people, so should we. So should we. Just because John is sexually attracted to people of the same gender doesn't make him less human. He's like every one of us. He has the same needs for intimacy. He has the same needs for community. And more importantly, he has the same needs for the gospel. In our culture, probably, there is this 
the gay community might think that my view was differently. Maybe because along the way, some Christians might have related to them awkwardly. And as a result of that, they think that, you know, Christians don't like them. As a church, as believers who gain the right insight from the word right now, we can change that. We can engage them like any other person. Talk to them about life. Talk to them about anything, about their hobbies, about their families, about their relationship, about their relationship problems. Invite them to our house, have a meal with them, get to know them deeply, show them what healthy, intimate, authentic friendship is like. We can do that. And by doing that, you treat them like how you would treat any pre-believing friend. You don't wait for them to clean up their lives before inviting them to know Jesus. You help them to draw close to Jesus who's willing to meet them in their mess. So church, I want to remind you, the big message of Christianity is not how people should behave sexually. The current climate might make it sound like this, but remember, it is not. The big message of Christianity is about the love of God through Jesus Christ. The good news of Christianity is that God loves us and He longs to bring people back to Him. And this is what everyone needs. We all have sinned. We all have turned away from God. Not just homosexuals, every one of us. Everyone are lost and we are in need of a Savior. And as you get to know John, you will find that he too needs love. He too have needs in, and sin in every, any other area of their life, not just this area in their, in their, in sexually. Don't just see them through their gay experience, but see them in every aspect of their life. So that's why you don't have to convince them about certain lifestyle. You don't even have to convince them that God is real. We have to come to them, show them their life, explain to them, and slowly go on the journey and they will begin to see, Holy Spirit will convince them of who God is through your life and through your love in their lives. In the end, we are not trying to make people straight. We want people to be safe. We want people to be safe. Sometimes we might find ourselves in a tricky situation like this that I, I heard this common situation around. My friend asked me to join a Pink Dog event or any other um, maybe um, pro-LGBT activism event to show my support and love for him. Instead of me telling you uh, what you should do and what you should not do, I want to give you some questions for you to think about and so that you can really think about this decision in a, in a, in a clearer and more biblical way. What is the objective and purpose of Pink Dog? Is it really just freedom to love? What is that agenda behind this gathering? What does your attendance to the event then signify? What does it tell? Are there other ways that you can show your love to him or her without attending the event if you disagree with it? Have you tried to explain both your beliefs and the importance of friendship to the person? I think that we can ask God for greater wisdom on how we can engage this. It's not so straightforward, but I believe that uh, as we have some handles and we think about it, we are able to find alternative ways so that we don't feel cornered, that we don't feel the social pressure to conform. And by doing that, we are not just making a stand, but we are making our voice heard, God's voice uh, being heard in the world. Number three, the world needs our example. The world doesn't just need what we say, but the world needs our example. More than just saying what we are against, we should be showing to the world what we are for. And we learn from the Bible in, in, in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter was written to the churches in Asia Minor region who was going through social persecution and suffering. And, and Peter was telling them, in this hostile environment, this is what you should do. Live such good lives. Live such good lives among the pagans. As believers, the way we live, we show forth God's character. We show forth God's value. 
to the extent that don't, they accuse you of doing wrong. They may say, I don't like your belief, I don't agree with you, you know, but they may see your good deeds, but they see your life, they see the example that you live, and they will say, wow, I, 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 I can't fault you for that. Because the way you live, I have nothing else to say. You see, in this area of sexuality, the greatest sermon and argument for God's design and His goodness and truth, it is not just in the logical and the sound arguments and reasoning that we can give, but it is more so in the way that we say it. Even if we say the right thing, but not in the right way, people might not listen to us. And more than that, in the very lives that we live. Every one of us, how are we living out the various areas of life? Two areas that I want to show us on how we can be faithful witness in the world. Through our marriage and families. How are we living out our family and our marriages? If divorce rates within the church are no different from that of the world, what does it tell of Christian marriage? If marital unfaithfulness exists in Christian marriages, what kind of message are we sending to the world? Christ-centered marriages, Christ-centered family should be significantly different from marriages and families without Jesus. It should be and it must be. And when someone who do not know Jesus come in contact with you, who walks with Christ, who do your marriage and your family in God's ways, can they see, can they feel a difference? I'll give you some example on some of the various ways. In, in, in different ways that we go through in our trials, in the way we forgive one another, in the way we go through hardship in raising children, in the way we age, and we see the different chapters of life, and we see retirement, when we see growing old, when we see grandparenting, your values should stand out from that of the world. Three weeks ago, I remember I was needing to uh, solemnize a couple in West Center. They are about to get married uh, three weeks ago. And the day before their wedding day, the groom called me and said that, Pastor, my bride is down with dengue. And just the day before the wedding day, I tell you, they were so devastated. All the hard work, all the preparation, they had to scramble and change, and now they have to manage that. Um, three weeks later, they are supposed to get married again. The father, the bride's father is down with dengue. So it was so challenging, and they were trying to like, it's so much um, a tough time for them. And yesterday, uh, they got married, and during their wedding day, uh, in West Center, right? During their wedding day, the couples went on stage and testified God's goodness, God's faithfulness, and tell them that what they went through as a couple before their wedding is that trial. It's a sign and show that of God's devotion for them, and it's a sign of how they should continue to love each other through trials and perseverance in their marriage. So the West Center, you all know who uh, the couple is, you know? And I, I thought that is a very great way to show the world that, hey, it, that Christian marriages should have a difference. The way that we respond should make a difference. Secondly, the way that we can do it is through standing firm. True standing firm. Another way that we can live as God's faithful witnesses in this world is to choose to stand firm in biblical values when the need arises. I believe somewhere, somehow, many of us will be put to test you'll be put on the spot where, you're, where you think, should you compromise your faith or should you stand firm on your values, on your faith and do what is right and how to do what is right. That is also the key. More and more companies are implementing DEI policies, as I say just now, the diversity, equity and inclusion policies. And some of these policies include inclusion events and talks that um, advocate LGBT agenda. There's this quite extreme example that I want to bring out to us that I've taken as well from the Protect Singapore Town Hall that to just show us, to help us have a glimpse of it. The MNC that I work for, MNC meaning the multinational company that this person say he worked for, is outwardly extremely supportive of Pride and LGBTQ. They run many events yearly in support of this with senior management support from the very top. Significant resources are spent on diversity or bias training, 
we are strongly encouraged to self-ID and employ the use of preferred pronouns in our email signature, Zoom and various other places, meaning the preferred gender pronouns need not be he or she, it can be anything that you choose. All the senior management is doing this and employees can often feel the pressure to conform to views of the senior management on LGBTQ's issue. I feel uncomfortable with this because it does not align with my values. There's another person that says there is a sense that if one wants to progress in one's career, one will not be able to freely speak up about their views in this area because it runs in counter uh, to the LGBTQ lifestyle. And it could, when you say out, it could be a career limiting move. I recognize that the challenges and the pressure that some of us might face, you know, with regards to our careers, with regards to how people might view you, your colleagues and your bosses. And in fact, it can be very stressful, like, especially in the whole environment is, is like that. And I, there isn't, it's hard to give specific guidelines on what you need to do. But we can, I want to remind you today from God's word that God has placed you there for that purpose to influence and to be sought and light, to be in the world, but not of the world. And God didn't just place you there alone because you have the Holy Spirit with you. You have the Holy Spirit with you that you can tap on, you can look to, you can go to the toilet and say, God, Holy Spirit, help me. Help me, give me wisdom on what to do, what to say, what should I do? And of course, if you're uncertain, there's a community that we're all going through this, this together. We can discuss and learn together. So as we courageously stand firm, church, remember, God can use you to open up conversations of faith with other people. As you stand firm, as you do what is right, the world is watching and they can see and they'll wonder, they'll be curious, why is this person believing in this? And this person's life, this person's attitude is showing there must be something true and real about this. And God will use your testimony and your standing firm as a witness to His character and His goodness. So let me summarize today. How can we engage our culture in this area of sexuality? Remember that the world will oppose our values and our beliefs, but we need not be afraid. We need not be fearful because we are God's people. Jesus has already warned us. Number two, the world needs our voice. We, not, we shouldn't be silent. We should do what is right. We should speak out and influence wherever we are. The world needs our example, not just with what we say, but the life that we live by standing firm through our marriages, through our family. The church has a key role in doing that. As we conclude, I want to share another story from True Love Is as well. And this story share show us how the community of God, every one of us, the community of God, reach out and accepted this person called Jason, who is struggling with SSA. And that acceptance have helped Jason to, to be able to talk about this issue openly and have led him towards closer to Christ. And it is a reminder for us that the purpose of us doing this series is more than just equipping us with the knowledge, but it's to shape every one of us, our culture, the way we see, so that we can be a better witness to people out of the church, so that we can be better disciple makers to help people grow in this area of sexuality. And I was preparing this sermon. I just want to say this before I end. God wants to speak to some of us here that you are struggling with same-sex attraction. And God wants to tell you that it is not a shameful thing. It's not a shameful thing. And shame has gripped you. Shame has made you feel bad. Shame has given you suicidal thoughts. But don't let the devil, don't let sin get a hold on us and what we have done in the past get a hold on us. But remember that in Christ we are free. 
In Christ, we are accepted. In Christ, we are loved. And because of that, you can come out. And because of that community of God, every one of us, it is not a shameful thing that anyone come out and say, I would believe and wish and hope that moving forward in our church, we can have conversations about this issue and anything. Anyone can come and say, I have a struggle in my sexuality. I am not straight. And no one will be ashamed of you. And we can talk about this freely because we know what the Bible says. We know there is hope. We know the way forward. So today as you watch the story, let's become a safe place for people who have SSA struggle to journey together, to follow Christ together. Let's watch the story of Jason. Nowadays, when people ask me, so Jace, what do you do? I travel countries as a motivational speaker and I'm the author of the book, If You Only Live Twice. I share in this story how I was found in Cambodia 10 days after my accident with a death certificate. How the fact that I'm still breathing and walking is because the author of this story isn't actually Jason Yolt. The real author is Amazing Grace. The kind of grace that's faster than any high-speed chase, mightier than any flaming explosion, and most of all, greater than any shame. My name is Jason, and this is the other side of my story. I woke up 40 days later to my tired and worried parents. As my parents were cleaning, feeding, and just loving me, a thought hit me hard. What if I did not survive the accident? What if they learned that I could not share my secret struggle with them because I was ashamed? Or more so because I thought they'd be ashamed of me? It would kill them too. My secret struggle? I like... men. It all started when I was 14, when I stumbled on some gay porn and got curious, fascinated, and eventually hooked. I had only liked girls before. I was confused by the growing attraction to guys. And I remember my journal entry that said, oh damn, I think I'm becoming gay. I hope it won't be worse. I'll stop it soon, I hope. When I came out to them, they told me that even though they don't approve of it, they loved me because I was their son and that love wouldn't change for anything. My close friend, let's call him A, had an amazing life by most books. He was charming, sporty, and he pretty popular amongst his friends. He was someone I loved and trusted entirely, so I decided to come out to him. He was quiet for a bit and told me, Everything's gonna be okay, lah, bro. What I didn't realize then was that the person he was saying those words to wasn't just me. What broke my heart was that I had to learn from mutual friends only after his funeral that A was struggling with being gay and that he took his own life. I had to ask myself, was I not a safe place for him to come out to? Would things have turned out different if he had someone or a community he could share all that pain, guilt and shame with? Would he still be here if he didn't feel alone? I am grateful for my community. The first time I came out to anyone years ago was at church to my small group. I had never felt so nervous in my life. But as each of us let our walls come down, we realize that we're not so different after all. We're all broken in our own ways. All of us just doing our best with what we can. That was when I felt accepted. When I knew that God's design for family is where I belong. I saw the beauty of man and wife in marriage in how they complemented each other. And it makes me believe it's how it's supposed to be. But I still continue to fool around on my desires, especially when I got lonely. 
It wasn't until 2017 when things changed. It was just like any other Sunday that God convicted my heart at church. There was no bright shining light, no powerful sermon or special worship arrangement. God's still small voice just spoke to my heart and asked if I was ever satisfied beyond the physical, the superficial. He asked me because He was calling me into the kind of love that's better than anything I've experienced before. As of the point of this video, I may not be free of these same sex desires just yet, but these desires don't define me anymore since God's love took hold of my life. So my parents asked me, Son, will you ever bring a boy home for Chinese New Year? What will others say? I told them, <laughs> No la, I, I may not be free from my desires, but I no longer want to pursue them. I can be open with others about my struggles, mainly because the true love of God has found me. God has set me free from guilt and self-condemnation, and I wish that for everyone. It is so touching to hear um, what Jason said. It's so touching to hear that the community, the parents enfolded him and showed him God's ways and God spoke to him and worked in him as well. As we conclude the series, I want to bring us to a few pointers here to summarize everything up. Don't get caught in a false dichotomy that sometimes we are presented with in our world with our friends. But remember, God is both holy and loving. And we need to be both biblical and apathetic. It is not either. It is not just about the Bible. It is both the Bible and people. At the end of the day, the truth that we say is loving. But loving means being truthful, pointing people to what is best for them. As we conclude the series, let's do better church. In relating to people who are outside the church, LGBT individuals, I believe we can do better. We can learn more. And within the church, let's become the kind of community that God called us to be so that we can continue to journey with people who have same-sex attraction moving forward, journeying together, pointing them to Jesus, pointing them to live in godly ways, supporting them, asking them, and helping them to find healing in different areas of their life and different hurts from the past. It is a long journey. It's a complex one. But we've got to let our friends, our fellow brothers and sisters know they are not alone. We are here together. We are fellow sinners who have found the grace of God in our lives. I want to invite you, church, to pray together, to worship together. So can I invite you to stand together and in our centres as well, can you just rise on your feet? We want to have some time to worship and pray together. Let's worship together. Yes, all of you 
is all I need. Take everything. You are my life and my treasure. The one that I can't live without Here at your feet my desires and dreams I lay down Oh, we lay it down Here at your feet my desires and dreams I lay down If more of you means less of me Take some time to pray together, church. We're going to take some time to pray for ourselves as a community of God that as we stand firm to not waver in our truth, we also want to be a witness for the world around us. We want to pray, I want to pray for every one of us that God will, as we learn in these two weeks, that God, whatever as God sent us out to be His people, to be salt and light, He will ground us on His truth and equip us with His love to show people um, what how to really think about this issue and how we can be His people to shine His light in this area of sexuality. Shall we pray together, church? So wherever you are, let's just lift our hands. Let us pray together. Father, we are thankful. We are thankful that uh, your Bible speaks about very relevant issues in the world. That your Bible has given us the, the design for sexuality and give us wisdom, O oh God, in how we can relate to people who have very different values from us, O oh God. Lord, I pray that we will stand firm, 
on your truth and not compromise on our conviction and not give in to the social pressure to conform, O oh God. Lord, we want to base it on you because we want to show people you and that, Lord, as believers, we worship a God and we believe that you have the best way forward and you are able to show your love through us, O oh God. And when the time comes, Holy Spirit, empower us. Holy Spirit, give us wisdom in what to speak, how to say it, how to have conversations with people around on this topic, O oh God. But more importantly, O oh Lord, help us and teach us to continue to live out holy lives for you, especially in the areas of our families, in the areas of our marriages. I pray, O oh God, for all the families and all the marriages in our church, O oh God, that they will be strong, that they will be Christ-centered, that they will help the world to see that Christian marriages have a difference in the way we relate to our spouse, in the way that we do our parenting, in the way, oh God, that we go through trials in life, oh God. And Lord, I pray that as we live such good lives in you, that the world can see you more and more through the way that we live, oh God. And I pray for every one of us that in our companies, in our workplaces, Lord, we are able to learn to stand firm because by standing firm, we'll be your witness as well to who you are in our lives. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to pray for us as well. Like one, last, one last point is that I think one big part of this sermon today is that I hope that as we live today, these two weeks, we learn, we have a better idea of what God sees this area and we are able to present His heart, His love and His truth to people out there who are struggling in this area, to our people who are identifying with this area and we will love them we, we can see the opportunities to bring the gospel to them and I pray that God will use us as a church to even change the narrative in our culture because we can do the right thing through the way that we live and through the things that we say. Do we want to do that together? Shall we pray together? Come on, let's lift our hands. Let's pray together. Father, we're going to pray for us as a church. We're going to commit ourselves to you. Lord, we know that in the Bible, God, you have spoken very clearly that we are able to love people who are far away from you. Jesus, you have shown us what it means to have a meal with people who are far away from you. You are interested in them. You get to know them and you love them. Oh God, Lord, I pray you use us as well as your people not to go up to them, to tell them to live up to certain standards, to live up to certain morality. That's not, oh God, that what you're telling us to do. But Lord, what you're telling us to do is to love them and see their needs and see their life. And Lord, as we bring hospitality to them, Lord, as we love them, they will experience you as well. We'll help them to see that, 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 that the only way to live is not just to live by their sexual orientation and their desires, but we can even tell them and help them see testimonies from our faith, from the Christian view that can even inspire and touch them, O oh God. And Lord, I pray you use every one of us as a church that through the small groups of circle of friends that we have, we'll be able to make big impact in the world around us that people will begin to see you differently. And in our community here, Lord, I pray that you prepare us to be ready to enfold all kinds of people who can walk into the church and they know they can find the gospel, they can find who they are in you. They are not ready yet. They are not, they, the lives might be messy yet, but Lord, we know that as we commit them to you, as we love them like you do, Lord, we can help them to disciple, we can disciple them to be more and more like you in days to come, oh God. Help us as a community to be a safe place for people who struggle in all areas of their life, especially in areas of their sexuality, oh God. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.